The following is a clip from the live breakdown and analysis of Giuseppe Roberto Tarantino's dissertation specifically on the open gaming license submitted in 2019 for a PhD in the field of intellectual property law. This dissertation is publicly available. The link to it is in the description. Okay, all right, so here we have the history of the open game license, which is really what, we, what we're concerned with here, the road to the open gaming license. So for most of the first three decades of its existence, D&D was published by TSR, <laughs> incorporated beginning in the 1970s and continuing to the very early 1990s. D&D represented not just the pioneering entry into a new category of entertainment product, i.e. the RPG, and not only was it by far the most popular example of that product, but there were stretches in which the game was a genuine popular cultural phenomenon. In the 1980s alone, D&D spawned a Saturday morning cartoon, which ran for three seasons, and a moral panic rising from the suicide of a university student that was blamed on the fact that he played D&D. In 1982, CBS aired Mazes and Monsters, a primetime movie of the week starring Tom Hanks, and in 1985, 60 Minutes devoted a segment to exploring whether or not D&D was a dangerous to the moral and mental health of its players. And playing D&D is a recurrent element on The Big Bang Theory currently broadcast, broadcast television's most popular sitcom. This was back in 2019. For the first 20 or so years of its publication, <clears throat> from the first copies mailed in the 1974 from the living rooms of its co-creator Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, to the sprawling product line that developed in the wake of the release of second edition in 1989, which was carried in book, toy, and hobby shops around the world, D&D was a steady source of income for its owners and by far their most lucrative products. TSR, now this is this is what came up that I didn't know about until all this started, but people have been telling me in the comments. TSR had long been seen to be an aggressive enforcer of its intellectual property rights. Indeed, the company had gone so far as to sue its co-founder, Gary Gygax, for copyright infringement after he departed the company and tried to publish competing RPGs with other publishers. Throughout the, that's incredible. Throughout the 1980s, TSR had sued or threatened to sue competitors and even players who published gaming materials which were expressly designated as being compatible with D&D. Oh, we just talked about that uh, as far as compatibility with trademarks. So they sued or threatened competitors and even players who published gaming materials that were expressly designated as being compatible with D&D. By the mid-1990s, with the community of RPG gamers enthusiastically moving into a nascent online world, TSR's attempts to enforce its copyright and trademark rights against gamers who shared fan-created material had earned it the uh, sobriquet, sobriquet, I believe that's how you pronounce that word, T dollar sign R, and prompted long-running online debates about the extent of TSR's intellectual property rights. TSR's position on online fan content had been described as adversarial. The company routinely, if understandably, objected to websites hosted online, hosting online files that contained digital copies of entire PS TSR published works, but they also voiced objections to websites and files containing excerpts from published works and even to entirely new player-generated content containing elements of our copyrighted properties, including characters, settings, realms, realm names, uh, noted magic spells, elements of the gaming system, such as armor class, hit dice, and so forth. Despite its historic commercial success, by the mid-1990s, TSR was in dire financial straits. These troubles were the result of a mix of a fast, a fiscal and popular culture stresses. One of the major causes was a pronounced and durable shift in gamer preferences from tabletop or pen and paper RPGs like D&D to computer and console-based games and to collectible card games, CCGs. CCGs was, a, was the most popular in which, of which was Magic the Gathering, released in 1993 by Wizards of the Coast, used decks of pre-printed cards similar in size and shape to bat baseball cards and attracted enormous amounts of attention and gamer spending away from traditional RPGs. A second major cause related to the first was the financial impact of massive amounts of returned inventory from book retailers who had overestimated the continued popularity of traditional RPGs and RPG-inspired fantasy novels in the face of the new CCG craze, which developed in the wake of Magic the Gathering success. A sustained run of poor business decisions by TSR management and ownership increased financial strain on the company. Notably, TSR overpaid for licensed content, alienated popular writers, and published an overabundance of gaming and gaming-related products, which resulted in a market glut and decreased revenues. By the end of 1960, 1966, 1996, the company was $3 million in debt. I didn't know that. The company was $3 million in debt. I knew it was bad, and I've been hearing that it was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. It was $3 million in debt, and numerous potential purchasers were considering acquisition. In 1997, imagine me, $30 million in debt. And of course, that's in... That's in 1996, too. So you got to remember, $1996, $30 million in debt for publishing Dungeons & Dragons. 
by publishing Dungeons & Dragons. Wow. In 1997, Wizard of the Coast, riding a wave of success from its customizable card games, purchased all the assets of a floundering TSR for an undisclosed amount. Two years later, in 1999, Hasbro... Oh, that was only two years later? I didn't, okay, so that was that happened much faster than I remembered. Two years later, in 1999, Hasbro, one of the largest toy and game producers in the world, purchased Wizards of the Coast for a reported $325 million. Uh, shortly, okay, so shortly after purchasing TSR's assets in 1997 for $325 million, and with the second edition of D&D nearing its 10-year anniversary, anniversary Watsy turned its attention to the development of a new edition of the game in an effort to revive the brand following its displacement at the front of the gaming industry by CCGs. The third edition of D&D, retroactively dubbed and referred to in this chapter as 3.0, was released by WotC in 2000. And uh, Ryan uh, Dancy said that there was no... Um, nothing that was happening in the rule set was dependent or being caused by the open game license or vice versa. The, the, the idea that this was going to happen was not part of the, the, the rules development of the game. Those were separate projects. Although WotC, who wholly owned, was wholly owned by Hasbro, Hasbro evidently adopted something of a hands-off approach to the development and release of 3.0, given the process was far advanced by the time of the acquisition. Oh, so um, interesting. So that was that being planned by TSR. So, uh, but nearing its, WotC turns attention, the third edition was released by Hasbro. Although WotC was wholly owned by Hasbro, Oh, Hasbro was hands-off. Okay. Containing the revamped game mechanics, dubbed the D20 system for its reliance on using the isocahedric 20-sided die as its core gaming mechanic, was one of the transformational aspects of 3.0, and it was released in tandem with the OGL, an open game con open content license created specifically for third edition. The OGL was one component of three related but discrete aspects of Wizards of the Coast 3.0 release system. So the D D20 system, we can't forget about that because we've got rule books and books that have the D20 system logo on it, right? Which was different from, you know, Wizard of the Coast, Dungeon Dragons, D20 system has its own logo. And OGL and its associated, the OGL, so one was the D20 system, the OGL and its associated system reference documents, and the D20 trademark license. Each of these elements and interaction between them requires further explanation. So I would like, uh, this is good because I would like clarification on that because I believe there's something about something that being challenged and lost, right? And while the other ones remain. The D20 system was a reconfiguring of the D&D rules to streamline them and unite them around a core gameplay mechanic using the 20-sided die as the main device for assessing success or failure within the rules of the game. Previous editions of the game had made uh, promiscuous and haphazard use of various multi-sided dice in gameplay. Only devotees of the game knew when a six-sided die would be needed as compared to when a four, eight, ten, or twelve-sided die would be required. Hey, that's a unified uh, action resolution mechanic. We've been talking about those, and we've been talking about RPG development on the morning grind, specifically on Tuesdays, and we've been looking for, uh, when we're trying to learn how to play RPGs, what is their core action resolution mechanic, and hopefully they have one and are not relying on something very haphazard and arbitrary like had been previously. That That is, to me... And advance. That's actually advancement in RPG, shall we say, technology. Uh, that's actually advancements that's made in tabletop gaming, I think. Uh, 3.0 consolidated, not not that it was the first one to do that, but uh, have a, not that this was the first one to have a core as action resolution mechanic, but it uh, was the big one, right? Because of the brand. While under the hood, so 3.0 consolidated the most dice-based activity on the 20-sided die. While the under the hood, the revision of the rules was fairly dramatic, the game still looked and operated much as it always had. It was still a desktop, excuse me, a tabletop fantasy RPG that made use of elements already present in the original 1974-79 editions of the game, and someone who had played this game in the late 1970s would have little difficulty picking up the new rules or recognizing the game that was being played. Although the D&D rules had been streamlined into the D20 system, the non they nonetheless still filled hundreds of pages spread across the 3.0 Player's Handbook, Dungeons and Masters Guide, and the Monster's Manual, which itself was nothing new. The 1977 first edition of AD&D also occupied hundreds of pages of rules. The OGL was designed to operate in conjunction with the D20 system, i.e. it was intended to make the D20 system open by granting access to the D20 system. That access was enabled by a separate component, the release of the text of the D20 rules in the SRDs. While the printed 3.0 rulebooks were hardbound 
books containing lavish illustrations, WotC also released the SRDs, rich text formats, RTF, files containing stripped-down expressions of the game rules. In effect, the SRDs were the source code of D&D. The art SRDs were made available online and remain free to access and download. Making them available, making available the SRD then, is the equivalent of the open source approach for providing access to the source code of a computer software. The SRDs were made available under the terms of the OGL, an open content license that permitted reuse of the materials contained in the SRD and the condition of compliance with the OGL. The mechanics of the operation of the OGL were examined in further detail are examined in further detail in part four of this chapter. So we will get into that. Okay, finally, the D20 trademark license permitted the use of Wizards of the Coast registered D20 system trademark to indicate compatibility with the D20 system. So that was the emblem you were supposed to use, which ideally, I suppose that was the fix, the initial fix to our 5e emblem, not really problem, but um, multiplicity. The D20 system trademark itself was simply a stylized text box that included the words D20 system and was intended to be to be placed on the covers of publications to indicate the gaming product used the mechanics of the D20 system. By using the D20 trademark license, other RPG publishers could publish RPG material that was expressly marketed as being compatible with the D20 system that underlay the new 3.0 edition of D&D, the world's most popular RPG. The D20 trademark license was supplemented by the D20 system trademark guide, which contained detailed guidelines for the use of the mark, ranging from the required statements of compatibility with Wizards of the Coast D&D publications. Uh, for example, licensees were required to include in certain statements on the front and back cover of their publications, such as requires the use of the Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook, 3rd edition, published by Wizards of the Coast. I remember that, because that was what they were saying. Let's sell player's handbooks. You get this, but you've got to have a player's handbook in order to play. To required font and logo and font sizes, the logo must be one inch in width by one inch in height. The text of required statements must be no smaller than 10 point and no larger than 12 point font. From the first version, the D20 trademark license, in conjunction with the D20 system trademark guide, also imposed restrictions on the content of gaming products, which could be created and branded as the D20 system. So that I think that's what becomes impor important. From the first version, the D20 trademark license we're not talking about the ogl we're talking about the d20 trademark license in conjunction with the d20 system trademark guide also imposed restrictions on the content of gaming products that which could be created and branded as d20 system products which is different from saying they could be ogl right one significant restriction to products uh, one significant restriction prohibited such products from containing rules or character creation and advancement i remember that being a big thing you couldn't talk about how to create a character because the character creation guides were supposed to be the player's handbook. You're supposed to have the player's handbook for character creation and advancement. The creation of an advancement rules of uh, the creation and advancement rules are foundational to any RPG game playing experience. They enable a player to define a character that the player will be using in the game world and provide a mechanism for the character's persistent persistence and advancement through multiple sessions with the application of experience points to the character's defined abilities. Okay, yes, we know what that is. Essentially, the rules by which a character becomes stronger and more powerful. Without such rules, the gaming product could not be considered a full game by usable uh, usable by players. So that was the intention. You can't publish a full game and be using the D20 trademark. A gaming product could not be considered a full game usable by players. Thus, though that thus through that restriction, the D20 trademark license functionally prohibited licensees from creating complete tabletop gaming products which could compete with D with D&D and still use the D20 system branding. That was the mechanic there. The three different components, the D20 system, the SRD, the OGL, and the D20 trademark license were intended by WotC to operate as follows. A non-WotC publisher, so okay, the intention, a non-WotC publisher could use the OGL to obtain a license to use the OGL system, excuse me, to obtain a license to use the D20 system rules that were contained in the SRD, and in reliance on the content contained in the SRD, create new RPG gaming materials that could be marketed and sold subject to compliance with the terms of the D20 trademark license as being compatible with the D20 system, and hence the third edition of, of D&D. But what you're saying you're compatible with is the D20 system. In other words, WotC anticipated that the OGL and the D20 trademark license would be used in tandem by publishers. Those publishers would create materials such as gaming supplements and adventure modules that WotC viewed as less profitable than the core rulebooks of the game. Right, and there were tons of modules and everything like that published. 
That being said, it was also, it, that being said, it was not necessary to use the SRD, OGL, and the D20 trademark license in tandem. As described in more detail in part five of, the, five of this chapter, use of the OGL is not conditional upon the use of the D20 trademark license. Use of the OGL is not conditional upon the use of the trademark license. Licensee are free to use the SRD OGL to create gaming products without the use of the trademark license. While the D20 system was created in conjunction with D&D's third edition, WotC itself also adapted it for use with other RPGs. They released a D20 system for Star Wars RPG in 2000, which I remember playing quite a bit, and two other genre RPGs, including D20 Modern, which I did play once or twice, and D20 Future. I did not know there was D20 Future. Never played that one. So, C, Watsi's motivations and rationale for the creation of the OGL. Oh, look, we're bringing up Ryan S. S. Dancy, who we heard from today. The OGL has been described as the brainchild of Ryan S. Dancy, a corporate vice president and brand manager for Wizards of the Coast, who is credited with the initial conceptualization and even the drafting of the OGL. In describing the origins of what he dubbed the open gaming movement, Dancy explicitly identified Richard Stallman, generally recognized as the founder of the free software and open source movements, as the source of inspiration. In an interview with Dancy published prior to the release of D&D's 3.5 edition, Dancy cited GNU's general public license, the pioneering open source license of the Free Software Foundation's GNU project, as the foundation of an ongoing attempt to create a similar license for gaming. Dancy noted similar various similarities between software development and RPGs. He described them as both complex systems using standardized protocols and interfaces that are shared by many people with many independent subcomponents that have worked together. The trifecta of components that made up D&D's third edition, the D20 system, the SRD, the OGL, and the D20 trademark license, originated in Dancy's belief that the strength of D&D was not in its game system, but instead in its gaming community. And he talked about that today, the set of people who actually played the game. Business considerations played a prominent role in Dancy's innovations. His view was that the proliferation, and remember, he took over when D&D was in a disaster of a state, or TSR, as a disaster of a state. functionally contribute to the viability of an ever-increasing market of RPGs. Dancy expressly mentioned what he described as the theory of network externalities, which he talked about today, according to which the value of a product is dependent on the number of users that of that product, hence the desire to create a unified mechanic, the D20 system. Dancy also believed the truth of what he was referred Dancy also believed in the truth of what was referred to within Watsi's as the SCAF effect, named after Watsi's staffer SCAF Elias. The SCAF effect was the belief that the market leader for tabletop RPGs, Watsi, would only benefit from the success of other RPG publishers. So who was that? The SCAF effect. I didn't know this had a name. The SCAF effect. Uh, the Watsi would only benefit from the success of other RPG publishers. In short, the SCAF effect predicted, we had a word for that. We've just named, found, well, we didn't name it, but we found the word for something. The SCAF effect. I like that. So in short, the SCAF effect predicted that people who became gamers via an RPG other than D&D would almost inevitably eventually become players and hitch purchasers of D&D products due to its overwhelming market presence, and that transition to D&D would be eased if the games all used a unified mechanic. A rough analogy can be constructed to traditional 52 playing card deck manufacturers, i.e. card decks containing suits of hearts, spades, clubs, and diamonds. If you are a card manufacturer, you have an interest in fostering the development of multiple different card games that use the 52 card deck, from solitaire to bridge to poker to blackjack and so on. Because new, as new games are developed or become more popular, players of those games will continue to need to purchase more of these decks. Combining all of these considerations led Dancy to the conclusion that the optimal strategy for D&D was to ensure that all RPG gamers were using the same underlying gaming system, the D20 system, but also to open the D&D rules themselves to others. 
he described it such an open access he just as he described it such an open access approach would lead to rapid constant improvement in the quality of the rules with lots of people able to work on them in public problems with math the ease of use a variance from standard forms etc should all improve over time the great thing about open gaming is that it's interactive Someone who figures out a way to make something work better and everyone who uses that part of the rules is free to incorporate that into their products, including Wizards of the Coast. In a marked move away from the position adopted by TSR, the previous owner of D&D, Wizards of the Coast adopted the stance that D&D rules themselves should not be the focus of enforcement activity. We want to use the trademarks of D&D to, uh, we want to use the trademarks of D&D to hold the value of the business rather than the rules themselves. Right, so the D&D, the rules themselves should not be the focus of of the enforcement activity. We want to use the trademarks of D&D to hold the value of our business, not our rules. This appears to be a reference to the use of the dual licensing strategy noted in chapter four, Watsy made the D&D rules. In chapter four, Watsy made the D&D rules in the form of the SRDs, which is essentially a text only word files available for free download and sold at retail high quality printed books bearing the D&D logos. In other words, Consumers could get stripped down versions of D&D rules for no cost and could purchase D&D compatible content created by third party publishers who use the OGL, but official D&D products would remain the exclusive provenance of Wizards of the Coast. In Dancy's conceptualization, the D&D game itself, conceived of as a creation separate and apart from the trademarks associated with it, should benefit from the shared development of all people who work on the create open uh, gaming der derivations of D&D. Dancy was explicit that he wanted and expected the OGL to result in the creation of new D&D content authored by Wizards of the Coast competitors. He wanted to let other publishers create supplements for D&D and to incentivize the creation of more D&D compatible products. He would, it was, uh, so uh, such an opening of the D&D network to infusions of D&D compatible content from creators outside the walls of Wizards of the Coast required an explicit pivot from the IP enforcement policies pursued under TSR. The OGL itself was to be both an instrument and the symbol of the changed approach. One of my fundamental arguments is that by pursuing the open gaming concept, Wizards can establish a clear policy on uh, what it will and will not allow people to do with its copyrighted materials. Just that alone should spur a huge surge in independent content creation that will feed into the D&D network. And he was trying to do that by making it ironclad and bulletproof that here you have permission to do these things and you're not going to have it taken away. This is what we're doing. And he then so brought out the OGL. There were also perhaps self-serving motivations articulated. Concern. There were also perhaps self-serving motivations articulated. Concerns about freedom of expression were, ex were cited, though such articulations are consistent with those voiced by the open source advocates who inspired the OGL. Open gaming is a recognition that your natural human right to free speech is protected and enhanced. The open gaming system is a way for the tabletop publishing industry to finally deliver on the basic promises made by the very first RPGs, that individuals should be free to copy, modify, and distribute their own creative works derived from the game systems that they have acquired. In addition, what were described as business-related reasons were set out. Notably, in the explanation, is the emphasis on the value of the trademarks and brands associated with the RPG product and the use of the open content license to drive value to the owners of the marks and brands. So this is a Q, uh, the Q&A. Is there a business-related reason to support open games? Answer. Uh, in, this case of, in the case of companies who own trademarks and brands associated with large player networks, one school of thought holds that open games which link those large networks will tend to reinforce them and drive value to the owners of those trademarks and brands. That is the primary reason that Wizards of the Coast, as a company, is supportive of the open game concept. It fully expects that it will gain a direct financial reward in years to come from the widespread positive effects that the open gaming will have on RPG properties, specifically on the sales of Dungeons & Dragons materials. Of course, the flip side of that theory is that if it is successful, it is successful because other publishers have also been able to extract value from the network of players through the sale and promotion of their own open gaming product lines. Everybody generates this wealth and money generated for everybody involved. Thus, at the same time, the large owners of game network trademarks and brands stand out to benefit greatly. So do smaller companies and individuals who simply want to sell their work to the largest possible audience of consumers. Okay, so what is the impact of the OGL? Describing the history of the OGL after its release in 2000 is best accomplished by separating out and focusing on five overlapping phases. 
the years 2000 to 2003, during which the OGL was used by third parties in a manner consistent with the expectations of WOTC, in conjunction with the SRD and the D20 trademark license, and primarily to create D&D supplements, particularly in the early portion of the era to create adventure modules. And I just remember the number of adventure modules just being everywhere. Uh, okay, so we got three different phases. So that was phase one, 2000-2003. Uh, from 2003 onwards, a period in which the OGL was used entirely apart from the D20 trademark license, and instead in conjunction with the publication of standalone games which competed with D&D in the RPG market. Beginning in 2006, the use of the OGL by multiple publishers to create retro clones, or recreations of old versions of D&D, which directly compete with D&D in the fantasy RPG market. And the, the creation of the retro clones, that was really interesting, that uh, Ryan uh, Dancy said that he did not anticipate the creation of the retro clones. It was one of the things that surprised him. He said not a lot of uses of the uh, SR, uh, the OGL and the SRD had surprised him, but the creation of the retro clones had. <laughs> he wasn't against it. He was just saying that it was surprising to him. Four, beginning in 2008, the abandonment of the OGL by WOTC in connection with the release of Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, followed in 2009 by the use of the OGL by Paizo, publishing to create the Pathfinder role-playing game, which becomes which became D&D's largest competitor in the RPG market, and five, finally, in 2016, the re-adoption of the OGL by WOTC in connection with the release of D Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition phase. Each of these phases will be discussed in turn. So use as intended, 2000 to 2003. The creation and release of the D20 system, the OGL, and the D20 trademark license marked a decisive turning point in the history of the RPG industry. Indeed, the new approach indicated by these devices was that such a departure from the previous IP enforcement approach of industry heavyweight TSR that some publishers initially thought that it was some kind of trap. <laughs> right, yeah, right. That is this real? As described in Part 3, the previous owners of D&D had engaged in aggressive enforcement activities, even going so far as to sue competing publishers who published material that was described as compatible with D&D. But WOTC was evidently committed in good faith to abiding by the spirit of the OGL and Dancy's public statements about open gaming, and the result was a renaissance in RPG gaming that saw the release of numerous new RPG products. Hundreds of new companies cropped up in response to the OGL. From the initial years following the release of the OGL and the D20 trademark license in 2000, it is difficult to separate out the effects of the SRD and OGL, which enabled access to D&D's source code contained in the SRD, from the effects of the D20 system and the D20 trademark license. For the initial years, it's difficult to separate those, as it appeared that most publishers elected to make use of both the OGL and the D20 trademark license simultaneously by releasing products that were expressly designed and marketed as being compatible with D&D 3.0 and the D20 system. Regardless, the immediate impact regardless, the immediate impact was obvious. Within a year of the release of the SRD, OGL, and a number of publishers exhibiting D20 system products at the RPG's largest annual trade show convention jumped from three to an estimated 75. Wow. The industry experienced a D20 boom that entailed the publication of hundreds of D20 com system compatible supplements, and D&D's third edition was an unqualified commercial success. Ryan Dancy had stated that in 2000, the year when D&D 3.0 was released, the player's handbook alone was selling more copies in a single month than the second edition sold in all of 1989, the year of its release. Wow. In 2000, the year 3.0 was released, the player's handbook alone was selling more copies in a single month than second edition sold in all of 1989, the year of its first release. That's incredible. So that was that success. That is some serious success. Further, Dancy has described the OGL as an integral aspect of the revival of D&D's fortunes. Most of, the most important thing to know about the history of the OGL and what succeeded it in the primary goal, which was to help relaunch Dungeons & Dragons, D&D returned to its place as a successful and profitable business, in part because of the OGL D20 product project. This project was not the sole reason for the restoration of the business, but was an integral part of a very complex plan. So, instrumental usage. 2003. In 2003, Watsi took steps which fundamentally altered the OGL D20 system landscape. Unlike the OGL, the D20 trademark license was both revocable and amendable, and it imposed restrictions on the nature of gaming products that could be released bearing the D20 mark. So, unlike this is important, unlike the OGL, completely different thing here, the D20 trademark license was both revocable and amenable. Well, unlike the OGL, there we go. We're telling him right there in this dissertation. 
OGL, not revocable. But the D20 license was. So that would be interesting. We could also compare the license. I don't want to do that today. But you could go back and compare the text of the D20 trademark license to the OGL and say, hey, the D20 trademark license has a lot more uh, restrictions and can be revo revocable. And here's, um, here's what you can do with it and what you can't. And it also imposed restrictions on the nature of gaming products which could be released bearing the D20 trademark. The latter feature meant that if anyone using the D20 trademark license was barred from creating a complete game capable of competing with D&D by supplanting it. You can't do that if you're using the, D <coughs> the D20 logo. In 2003, WotC revised the D20 trademark license to require that all materials released under the D20 trademark license meet community standards of decency, as determined by WotC. The change was made in order to stymie publication by Valar Project, Inc., of the controversial Book of Erotic Fantasy, a sexually themed supplement for d and I don't have the Book of Erotic Fantasy. Anybody have the Book of Erotic Fantasy? <laughs> Would that be, is that one we should, we should get and look at on the uh, morning grind one day? I don't know. I have no idea what's in it. <laughs> but at any rate, I remember when that controversy was going on, because I remember this happening and the uh, publication of this book, the Book of Erotic Fantasy. So what happened here? Uh, Valar, relying on the irrevocable OGL, ultimately published the book, dropping the use of the D20 trademark license. What this meant practically was that the content of Valar's book was largely unchanged, unchanged, <laughs> unchanged in the context of uh, erotic fantasy. Okay, it was unchanged, unchanged. <laughs> but the book and its marketing materials did not contain any reference to the D20 system or use the D20 marks and was not identified as being compatible with the D20 system. Around the same time, WotC made a decision to release a new edition of D&D, dubbed 3.5. The move was made with little announcement, leaving many other OGL publishers angry due to the fact that their product schedules contained, uh, continued to be geared toward 3.0 D&D, which made them passe in what had become a fast-moving RPG market. Uh, due to the fallout from these events, after this situation with the release of 3.5, due to the fallout from these events, which demonstrated to publishers that the newly amended D20 trademark license tethered them uncomfortably to content-related decisions made by WotC, use of the D20 trademark under the terms of the D20 trademark license dropped off precipitously after 2003, with many publishers switching to use the D20 system rules solely by relying on the SRD OGL and ceasing to brand their products as compatible with the D20 system. I also remember that. I mean, everything had that D20 trademark on it. And then all of a sudden that dropped. So that's why. So that's why. Nonetheless, D&D remained a successful product line even five years after the release of 3.0. In 2005, it was estimated that the D&D line of products was grossing between 25 and 30 million annually. As realization spread that they could continue creating materials using the OGL, OGL without also using the D20 trademark license. So that was probably a bing, oh, idea here. Wait a minute. These are three separate things and they work together in this way, but we don't have to use them in that way. Once that realization started to get made, competing publishers created not just, and I think that was when I was talking about you can't un-OGL. I think it was rela related to this because you can revoke D20 system. D20 system was revocable, but you can't un-OGL. That was the way it was. Competing publishers created not just relatively small-scale adventures, but also longer-form source books, campaign settings, lengthy descriptions of worlds and scenarios to which worlds can, games can be played, and even new games that directly competed with the D&D line game, something that had been effectively prohibited by the D20 trademark license because of its restrictions on products, including character generation provisions. But if you're not using the D20 trademark, then you can now create, tell about how to create characters and do whatever you want to in regard to that. Multiple games using well-known fantasy and science fiction brands were published using the OGL. Warcraft, the role-playing game, based on the hugely popular online game. Babylon 5, based on the popular sci-fi series of the same name. And EverQuest, based on the popular online game. White Wolf Publishing, estimated at uh, at one point to have a 25% share in the RPG industry. Oh, whoa. And uh, White Wolf was quite large there. Made enthusiastic use of the OGL, publishing dozens of OGL-related gaming products in 2000 many of which competed directly with the D&D and almost none of which used the D20 trademark license or referred to their compatibility with D&D. At this point in the history of the OGL, it becomes clear that there were two distinct ways in which RPG publishers could make use of the OGL. The first way of using the OGL, which I dubbed the conventional, involves a publisher using the OGL as a way of accessing the D20 system contained in the SRD. 
The form of use means that the gaming materials produced by the publisher consist in some measure of the D20 system or the other open game content material contained in the original WotC D&D SRD, such as making the use of the D20 system's rules for combat and spellcasting and the new gaming material is intended, to a greater or lesser degree, to be used by consumers in conjunction with the D&D game. In other words, conventional, use of those, conventional uses are those that align with Watsi's stated expectation that the material will be used to supplement their core gaming products. A second way of using the OGL, which I dubbed the instrumental, involves a publisher using the OGL as a means of making their content available on an open basis, irrespective of whether or not their content makes use of the D20 system or the Watsi SRD. In an instrumental use, a publisher creates gaming materials, be it an adventure, a campaign source book, or an entirely new game system, and releases it under the terms of the OGL in a manner which is entirely divorced from any use of the D&D, of D&D, the D20, or the D20 marks, such as Pathfinder. So the rise of retro clones, 2006. As described above, the OGL spawned the creation of numerous gaming products, from the anticipated adventures that players could use with the D&D game to longer source books, and even the entire new competitive, entirely new games competitive with D&D. But perhaps the most unpredictable result of OGL was the creation of what are sometimes called retro clones. Understanding the retro clone phenomenon requires a quick recap of, of D&D's publication history. From the initial version of the game released in 1974 through the fourth edition released in 2008, what marked each new release of the game with increasing complexity and density. The 1974 release consisted of three undersized soft cover booklets totaling 120 pages. By the time of the 2008 release, the core game consisted of three hardcover, oversized hardcover books totaling more than 800 pages. But it's important to note that each new set of rules contained in succeeding editions were functionally iterations of previous releases. A player reading the D&D rules in 2008 could see something which is certainly longer than the rules in 1978, but its core, the 2008 version, would recognize as being uh, premised on largely the same mechanics, though often embellished in different various ways. Whereas earlier versions of the game, being comparatively underdeveloped, embodied a somewhat freewheeling improvisational dynamic, placing significant onus on the game master and players to resolve in-game compl complications on the fly. By the fourth edition, the design of the game had become increasingly granular and rigid, with complicated sets of rules meant to govern virtually every conceivable permutation of gameplay. There was a significant cohort of gaming community, consisting mostly of older players, who were not just interested in playing D&D, but were particularly interested in playing the versions of D&D they had played back in the 1970s and 80s. But those versions of the game were long out of print and difficult to obtain. RPG player Stuart Marshall happened upon a solution. Since the SRD contained all the rules for 3.0 and 3.5 D&D, and since those rules for 3.0, 3.5 D&D are, at their core, essentially just more complicated versions of the rules for prior versions of D&D, then it should be possible to use the SRD and the OGR, OGL to reverse engineer or deconstruct the rules in order to replicate the rules for a desired prior version of D&D. The analogy is imperfect, but it's akin to extracting the rules of straight poker from the rules of Texas Hold'em, or the rules from checkers from the rules of chess. In 2006, Marshall published Osric, the old school reference and index compilation, which recreated the 1977 first edition AD&D game. In relatively short order, more retro clones were released, each utilizing the OGL. Labyrinth Lord recreated the 1981 version of basic D&D. Swords and Wizardry, 2008, recreated the original 1974 version of D&D. And For Gold and Glory recreated a second edition AD&D game. These retro clones were part of fan-based movement dubbed the Old School Renaissance, and that was what we call OSR, the Old School Renaissance, and that was documented and that was documented in online publications, including dozens of blogs and multiple fanzines. More than a dozen publishers identified themselves as members of the Old School Renaissance group. The publishers of D and D, as a result of the OGL, thus found themselves in competition with the resurrected version of prior editions of their own game, given new life by a community of gamers who, perhaps in part driven by nostalgia, thought out simpler sought out simpler, less involved rules with which to play. Oh, now we get to it. The abandonment of the OGL and the advent of Pathfinder. So the abandonment of the OGL and the advent of Pathfinder. By 2008, many of the individuals, including Ryan Dancy, who had spearheaded the development of the OGL at WotC nearly a decade earlier, were no longer employed by WotC. As it undertook efforts to develop and release the fourth edition of D&D, there was a major change in the institutional chance of WOTC, of WOTC with respect to the OGL. The fourth edition, released in 2008, abandoned use of the OGL and was released using a new gaming system license, GSL, that was significantly more restrictive than the OGL. An, ex an extract from the GSL's frequently asked questions document gives a flavor of the new approach. 
what parts of Dungeons & Dragons is open game content? Answer, none. None of the 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons product line is considered open game content, made available to third parties through the open gaming license. Certain content from 4th edition is available royalty-free for specific uses subject to the GSL. The move away from the OGL to the GSL was credited in part to the departure of Dancy from Wizards of the Coast. And he did answer why he left the, the company uh, on that stream. Because uh, people ask him, why did you leave Wizards of the Coast? And because he said, uh, when he was talking to his boss, he was saying that uh, he had been tasked with, re tasked with revitalizing Dungeons and Dragons. Here's what the TSR situation is. Find out, or, you know, find out exactly what situation TSR and Dungeons and Dragons is in because they had just bought it. Figure out what's wrong, fix it, and get D&D making money. And so he devised this plan and everything, and was successful at that and succeeded at that. And then he said he went into his boss and said, now that I've accomplished that goal, uh, where am I going, you know, next with this company? What's my next task or whatever? And he said that his boss said, well, I think you need to look for your next next task uh, outside of the company. I'm paraphrasing. Look that up. It's in that uh, role for combat stream. So that's how that happened. So that's, he departed. So he's like, well, okay, if I'm going to need to look for my next opportunity outside of, uh, you know, my, my next challenge, another opportunity outside of the company, he did. And then he found a position outside the company. So, the GSL featured major structural differences as compared to the OGL. In addition to mandatory licensing fees and restrictions to objectionable content, similar to those that had been implemented when revisions were made to the D20 trademark license, the GSL prohibited the creation of new games based on underlying mechanics of 4th edition. That prohibition avoided the specter of the 4th edition giving rise to the creation of games that competed with D&D using its own mechanics, which had been seen ever since to move away from the use of the D20 trademark license that began in 2003. Even more controversial was the inclusion of the GSL in the GSL of a poison pill clause that was intended to uh, uh, obliviate the function of the OGL. Oh, anyone who published material under the GSL was prohibited from using the OGL and surrendered any claim to being able to exercise rights under the OGL. I didn't know that. Learning new stuff all the time. The most, let me highlight that, the most controversial was the inclusion of the GSL of a poison pill clause that was intended to uh, obviate the functioning of the GSL. So this, the, they weren't trying to revoke or deauthorize it, because I don't think they thought that they could. So instead, this is the plan that they came up with, apparently. Okay, if you publish material under the GSL, you are now prohibited from using the OGL and surrender the claim to be able to exercise rights under the OGL. Can you do that? Many RPG publishers elected not to use the, GS the GSL at all, with one publisher describing it as a total unmitigated failure. Changes to the GSL in 2009, including the removal of the poison pill clause that forced users of the GSL to give up rights to use the OGL, were perceived by the industry as too little too late. D&D's fourth edition had been viewed in retrospect as generally unsuccessful, partly due to a reorientation of the rules to focus on the game, more on tactical combat and what had been described as an aesthetic and mechanical sensibility that's being targeted at video game players rather than traditional RPG players. I skipped fourth edition completely. It wasn't having to do with fourth edition specifically, it wasn't gaming at the time. So I happened to miss all of fourth edition. So I know very little about it. I didn't know that that was something that happened. The negative effects of the bungled fourth edition re release, release were compounded by a new development the creation of the Pathfinder role playing game by Paizo Publishing. In 2007, Paizo Publishing, to that date primarily a publisher of magazines serving the RPG fan market, released the first of its Pathfinder adventure publications, a series of interconnected adventures for D&D. Notably, consistent with the industry trend described above, Paizo released its gaming settlements using only the OGL and not the D20 trademark license. Of greater consequence, in 2009, Paizo used the OGL to create and release the Pathfinder role-playing game in 2009. Pathfinder is a complete gaming system based on the underlying D20 system made popular by Watsi's D&D 3.0, 3.5, and was designed specifically to appeal to those gamers who like 3.0, 3.5, and did not want to switch over to D&D 4th edition. Paizo updated and tweaked the rules, aiming for something akin to a version 3.6 or 3.75, rather than the complete overhaul of D&Ds represented by D&D's 4th edition. Pathfinder represented a new game, but it was one that was still recognizable as Dungeons & Dragons 3.0, 3.5. By 2012, the industry consensus was that Paizo's Pathfinder game was outselling Watsi's venerable D&D, and the efforts of many RPG publishers were devoted not to creating materials to support Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, but instead to support Paizo's Pathfinder. So you got this big switch. 
Lisa Stevens, the CEO of Paizo, has expressly credited the OGL for making the company's success possible. If Ryan Dancy hadn't had the crazy idea to create the OGL and then champion it through the halls of Wizards of the Coast, then I wouldn't have been able to have the success with Paizo uh, has become. Paizo used the OGL to release Pathfinder. It's supplement by it's is supplemented. <clears throat> Paizo's use of the OGL to re release path to re just release Pathfinder is supplemented by their active nurturing of an online community that creates additional Pathfinder content using the OGL. They have done so in part by creating two additional governance documents that exist alongside the OGL and speak to different types of activities carried on by the RPG community. As is discussed in further detail in part four of this chapter, OGL allows licensees to use the open game content of the licensure, but prohibits the use of the licensor's trademarks and any content that the licensure designates as product identity. In the RPG market, complain, com claiming compatibility with an existing game can be vital for the success of a gaming supplement. To enable such games, Pathfinder Roleplaying Compatibility License allows licensees to create new Pathfinder material using the OGL and expressly identify it as compatible with Pathfinder. To facilitate the access to their product identity, Paizo has developed a community use policy that permits their customers to create and make publicly available content that incorporates Paizo's product identity so it is not ex uh, so long as it is not exploited for commercial purposes. That's interesting, too. I didn't know about, about that. Uh, I want to check out the uh, Paizo's community use policy. Not today. <laughs> we should also look at the WotC fan policy. Not today. Those interested in making use of Paizo's RPG content thus have three ways that they can do so. By using the OGL on their own, in which case they are limited to open game content and cannot make claims about compatibility, but are otherwise free to use the licensed content in accordance with the OGL, including for commercial purposes. purposes. By using the materials released under the OGL in conjunction with a trademark compatibility license, in which they claim compatibility with Pathfinder game, but are subject to the constraints set forth in the compatibility license or using content that has been designated as product identity in accordance to the community use policy, which restricts any use to non-commercial activity. So that's your three ways. The Paizo website hosts online discussion forums featuring hundreds of thousands of posts, and the website hosts an online retail store that stocks not only Paizo's own products, but also the products of other publishers who create materials using the OGL or the compatibility license. To a significant extent, during the period which Watsi was stepping back from the OGL and its underlying philosophy and strategy, it was Paizo that delivered on Ryan Dancy's premise of how an RPG publisher should interact with its customers by means of a continued commitment to the OGL and the cultivation of an ongoing relationship with Pathfinder and its players. Like players and content creators. So, we are now to the re-adoption of the OGL by Watsi. In 2014, Watsi replaced D&D's 4th edition with a new 5th edition. The new edition was the result of the most extensive playtesting effort the RPG industry had seen to date. The new mechanics are simpler and enabled a more narrative form of gameplay than the constricted 4th edition allowed. Point, uh, prior to the release of 5th edition, there was some confusion about whether or not it would be released under the terms of the GSL, a different license, or no license at all. Nearly 18 months after the 5th edition was publicly released, Watsi announced that on January 12th, 2016, that their that they had released an SRD for 5th edition and that it was being made available under the terms of the OGL. The company that had created the OGL had completed a full... Uh, the company that had created the OGL had completed a full cycle between 2000 and 2016. From its initial release in 2000, through its abandonment in 2008, and then its re-adoption in 2016, Watsi returned to the use of the OGL in the face of market competition spawned by that very same license. Concurrently with its readoption of the OGL in January 2016, Watsi appeared to borrow a strategy from Paizo Publishing and announced the creation of the Dungeon Masters Guild, an online marketplace for Watsi, powered by online publisher One Bookshelf, provides space for its customers and competitors to sell content made using the OGL. The Dungeon Masters Guild allows contributors who agree to set, uh, who agree to set content guidelines to offer for sale on the Wizard of the Coast run website materials that are compatible with 5th edition, D&D 5th edition, using some of Watsi's product identity. Right, so if you want to write something for Waterdeep, you can do it, but you got to publish it through the Game Masters Guild and follow those rules, which is cool from a fan's perspective. Difficult to run a business on, but fun, cool. People liked it when Pathfinder did it, right? In 2019, the RPG industry appears healthy and more facilitative 
uh, participation than ever before. Publish well in 2019, the RPG industry appears healthy and more facilitative of participation than ever before. Publishers who are interested in selling their RPG content can choose from a variety of online platforms, including online storefronts powered by Watsi and Paizo, independent retailers such as RPG Now and Drive Through RPG, and even platforms dedicated solely to selling content licensed under the OGL which at this time of writing lists over 100 publishers offering content for sale. RPG conventions at which gamers gather to play and take place take place globally globally with the largest clouds attracting clouds over 50,000 attendees. The industry is dominated by two large publishers, Watsi and Paizo, but an entire ecosystem of medium-sized, small, and hobbyist publishers publish material for a, a, play, a paying audience estimated to number in the millions. 